So the last talk was about germs and how they might kill you. And we're going to talk about stem cells and how they might save you, or maybe not. Um, it's part of the debate. So stem cells, regenerative medicine, and us. That's what we talk about in biology and society. I'm at ASU in the Center for Biology and Society. So we want to look at biology, its intersection with what matters to us. And I feel passionately that when there are issues like stem cell issues, stem cell research support, we gotta know about it when we're gonna have, when we're gonna have votes, when we're gonna use public funding for, for research. So that's what we're about um, today. And maybe this will work, yeah, there we go. So lots of issues swirl together, political, scientific, medical issues all, all come together. Um, there's actually a history too, which I'll point to but not say much about. Um, so, most recently, March 9th, 2009, I'm sure you all remember back that far, when Obama signed the stem cell bill, stem cell enhancement bill, um, which was to use extra embryos to do research, potentially with federal funding, if the Congress authorized that funding, and he asked the NIH to develop guidelines. And you might say, you might have said at the time, you might say now, wait a minute, why is the president deciding what research we're gonna do? Isn't that supposed to be peer review? Isn't that supposed to be scientist? You know, presidents aren't supposed to be deciding we do this research rather than that research. But he felt he had to because there was a history of other presidents who had decided about research. Um, Clinton had passed an executive order which said, okay, we can fund some research, it's a good idea. Um, Congress had then passed an amendment which said, mm, let's be careful when we do research on embryos, let's be really careful about what we're doing. Um, Bush then, we remember, um, in August 9th, 2001, so before to September 11th that year, um, Bush said, no, 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 uh, we're only going to allow stem cell research on those stem cell lines that existed the minute before I started talking tonight, which was a kind of interesting decision. Um, it allowed some research, but not much new research. Um, Congress voted to enable stem cell research and then Bush vetoed. So we had a history of legislative response. There are a lot of words out there. We need stem cell research for innovation, for competitiveness. We need the clinical results. We need to help patients. There are a lot of reasons that stem cell research is thought to be great and that it is supposedly going to regenerate um, and pr provide regenerative medicine solutions to all of our problems, or at least many of them. Um, the idea is that we'll take extra embryos, meaning embryos that are in the fertility clinics that are locked away and going to be thrown away in, in most cases. Um, we'll allow them to be donated for research, for research to explore this sort of science. Um, Christopher Reeve was keen on our ability to in fact repair spinal cord injury, um, regenerate the, the functions of spinal cord. Um, obviously, those who have Parkinson's, like Michael J. Fox, want to, to solve Parkinson's, other people diabetes, lots of hope. Lots of hope out there. Lots of enthusiasm that we can take stem cells and put them to work, basically. Um, so why stem cells? What's the deal about stem cells? Well, here's a nice um, biology slide. You know, I'm a professor, so we have to have things like this with lots of little print that you can ignore. Um, and you can download the PowerPoint and you use it later. But, but, um, but this actually is extremely important. And this sort of picture is available on the NIH website. Um, as well as other places, but that's a great source of information. So, so in the beginning, there's an egg, and the egg gets fertilized, and it divides from one cell into two, into four, into eight cells. All of those eight cells are just the same. They're called totipotent, and they can make octuplets, which we now know in one case happened. We have one case of human octuplets. No comment on that. But after the eight cell stage, cells start dividing at a different rate in different ways and, and more quickly to the point where they get a couple hundred cells that are packed inside of a, of a ball. So on the third line up there on the right um, is a blastocyst as it's called. And it has a layer of cells outside that will become the placenta and inside the inner cell mass that are stem cells. They're pluripotent not totipotent, they don't have the potential to become all, they have the potential to become plural or to become any number of kinds of cells if you put them in the right culture. 
So those cells that are in that blastocyst on the third line are the really interesting ones for regenerative medicine and stem cell research. The hopes, and I love to show this picture because the NIH had it on its website um, under a title of Hopes for Stem Cell Research, and it makes it look like NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is hoping that we can cure um, we can cure problems in mice, that we can, in fact, you know, get insulin into mice. But, but it was very wise that they did that. They wanted to be careful not to hype, not to overextend and give the impression that we already knew how to do this in humans. And they wanted to show that we can, in fact, do this research in mice and hope to be able to do it in humans. To take that inner cell mass, those cells, and be able to culture them, and with the right culture medium, to be able to get those cells to become the right kind of thing. To become nerve cells, if that's what we want them to be, or heart muscle cells, or pancreatic cells that can produce insulin. So great hopes for stem cell research. And there are lots of pictures like this. I just pick one. There are many of them out there. The idea that the undifferentiated cells can be differentiated into, into what we want them to be. The idea of driving stem cells to work. You know, we can get them to do what we want and, and take them off on the right, on the right off ramp um, here. So cells are zooming along in development and becoming bone marrow or whatever we need them to be. That's the image that's, that's there. And there's a lot of reason to think that, but there's also reason to question in it, so um, history. So if I had a long time, if I had many hours, um, those of my students who are here and have taken courses know I can talk for many hours about the history of this stuff, but let me just say there is a history. So you heard about this in 1998, that there was this great stem cell research, but in fact it's been around for more than a century. Um, 1907 was the very first stem cell experiment. I like to point out to my stem cell researcher friends that they missed the chance to have a centennial. So there's been a lot of work. There's been a lot of work over the years, but it was 1998 for the first time that human embryonic stem cell lines of pluripotent cells were developed and, and could be used. So that's an important moment. What the research shows all the way through is that the culture matters. We can take those pluripotent stem cells, I say we, I mean they, but you know, we the people um, you know, supporting they, the researchers, uh, can take these cells and if we put them in the right culture medium, we can get them to do what we want. Okay, so there's an expectation that we can get them to do what we want and become heart muscle cells. There's probably somebody in the audience that has heart disease, and it would be nice if you could have some nice, healthy heart muscle cells and put them in there. So, so we, wanna, we think that we can and want to be able to take heart muscle cells or make those heart muscle cells to put them into a patient, and then we assume that they're gonna keep doing the same thing that they were doing in the dish when we made them. So we're gonna turn them in a culture dish into heart muscle cells and we expect when we put them in a different place, they're still gonna be heart muscle cells. But why do we make that assumption? Actually, research shows that the culture matters a great deal and they'll become heart muscle rather than nerve because of how they're being cultured. So when we put them in a person, which is a different culture, why wouldn't we expect them to behave differently? So there are a whole lot of complexities about how this is gonna work. Or I can't sing very well, but you know, imagine Liza Minnelli sort of saying, you know, if I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere, New York, New York, um, of cells. It's not the case that if they can make it in the dish, they can make it anywhere. They may be able to make a nerve cell in a dish, but not in the patient. Okay, even worse. Even worse, with stem cells, when we transplant them into mice or into some human patients, there have been some trials, lots of tumors result. So the pluripotent stem cells can become heart, nerve, other cells, or can make tumors. That's not what we want. All right, so just a side story here, cloning. Um, I just want to bring that in because I want you didn't know everything, and this is a review for some of you, but okay. Um, so cloning gets lumped together with stem cell research as if it were the same thing, which it's not. Um, it's a related issue, but really a separate issue. It's important because it raises the question of how much cells are already determined and how much they can respond to change, how much we can change them and get them to do what we want them to do. 
So what happens in cloning is exactly the same thing. You can, you can see it's the same picture here. Exactly the same thing that happens in normal development, except at the very beginning, we start by taking the nucleus out of the egg that we started with and putting in another cell. Okay, now why is that interesting? Well, when you guys leave today, every one of you is gonna leave behind cells. I mean, you're gonna leave hair cells or skin cells behind on your seats on the floor there. Um, we could take those cells and we could use those cells and put them into the egg cell and we would be able to get stem cells, pluripotent stem cells out of the process that were genetically just like you. So that's where the two come together and become very interesting in their potential, but also raise a lot of questions because we really don't know a lot about how that works and nobody's cloned humans yet, even though that guy in Korea claimed he had, he hadn't. So it hasn't happened and we don't know whether it will or when or how much, but cloning is an issue that exists out there that is potentially connected with stem cell research. There's also something that happened in 2006, um, which is very surprising. Um, induced pluripotent stem cells um, were found in mice or created in mice in 2006 in humans in 2007. So the problem with stem cells and stem cell research for pluripotent cells from embryos that we talked about, and this is what bothered George W. Bush as president, is you have to destroy the embryo to get the stem cells out. But what these researchers found in Japan and other, other places now, what these researchers have found is that in fact we can get so-called ethical pluripotent stem cells. It's possible just by adding some genes to a cell like those skin and, and hair cells that you're gonna leave behind today, we could take those cells and just put some different genetic factors, transcription factors they're called, put those into the cell and get pluripotent stem cell. Turn it into a pluripotent stem cell. De-differentiate. It was differentiated to be a skin cell. We de-differentiate or undifferentiate it, re-differentiate it as something else, a heart muscle cell. That's possible. It's being done in mice. It's possible in humans. We don't know how possible, how much, but it's a very, very interesting line of research. All right, so what do we know? We know that regenerative medicine is really hot, that there's considerable amount of money being put into this research. Um, it might work. It's probably going to work in some ways, but it probably won't work the way we think now. The way, in, the way science works is that we, we, we make predictions, we think we know what's going on, and then we're surprised. Like in 2006, we were surprised that it was possible to get induced pluripotent stem cells. Nobody thought that was possible. So, so we're gonna only be surprised if we're, if we're not surprised, in fact. Um, we really need, and so this sounds like a scientist talking, which I'm not, um, but we really need a lot more scientific research to be done. We're discovering tremendous amounts about, about development, about stem cell development, about possible clinical applications, tremendous amounts. So I think we need tremendously more science being done. However, however, I think it should be done with federal funding and with federal regulatory oversight. What was happening when we weren't putting federal funding in is that a number of companies were supporting this kind of research, and in effect, the research was going behind closed doors. There wasn't a transparency there, but it also was proprietarily owned. So if people discovered cures, companies were gonna own those, and most of the companies, or many of the companies doing the research, were not in the United States. And so it's much better, better I think, that we have federal funding and that we have this in the public domain mandate for scientific research. But it's also the case we shouldn't just have the research go off on its own. We need a lot more thinking about the ethical historical context as well. That also, I think, should be federally funded and with oversight. Okay, so regenerative medicine. This is a, re a report. This is the front cover of a report that, was, that, that came out in, um, in 2006. It was a report on where we were with stem cell research and regenerative medicine. It's Prometheus, and you all remember him well, not personally probably, but you remember the story of Prometheus. Prometheus was a bad boy. <laughs> P Prometheus made a mistake, um, he didn't think so, but he made a mistake and he gave humans the knowledge about fire. 
He wasn't supposed to do that, but he gave away the secret and made the gods really angry. And so the gods chained him to a rock. So there he is, chained to a rock. And every day the eagle comes and it, and it pecks out and eats out the liver of Prometheus. And every night the liver regenerates. And this is supposed to be a moral tale, right? Where don't be bad. Don't do what the gods tell you not to do. Look, it'll be a terrible thing. You'll be chained to a rock. And this eagle will come and it will peck out your liver. And that's a terrible thing. But in fact, this report from NIH and others said, wait a minute. Look, this is fantastic. The liver regenerates. <laughs> so in fact, the regenerative power of the liver, the regenerative power of our cells, if we can harness those to good, then we can let Prometheus live forever, but we can help other people live longer than they would have. So what does this mean for us? What does this scientific research mean for us is the question that we're confronted with. And since I'm part philosopher as well as part historian, my job is to raise questions. So the question is, what's going on with regenerative medicine and stem cell research, which I've told you a little about, but what does it mean and where do we want to go with it? What do we want to fund and how? That's a question. And we can all answer it together. Thank you.